This is James. And James died at the age of 24 from a terrible disease. In the last months of his life, he made a wish to the Willow Foundation, which is one of these organizations that help people grant uh, their last wishes. And James's last wish was that he could meet and greet the makers and creators of his, uh, his favorite video game. In his case, that was the Rome Total War strategy game. When the creators of this game heard about this wish, they decided to grant him this wish. So they invited him at their headquarters. And when he arrived at the premises of this headquarters, he told the staff members who were work working on this game his story. The staff members were so impressed by his story, by his battle, and by him as a person, that they decided to give him the honor of becoming one of the characters within the game. So based on a number of pictures, similar to the one here on the left, they recreated him as a Roman general. He could be his own person in the game. That reminded me of a quote from a quite famous writer called Banksai, who once stated that we as human be uh, beings will die twice. The first time is when your physical body dies. The second time is when your name is spoken for the very last time. In that sense, James achieved his own form of immortality. True, his body died, his physical body, but his appearance and his name lived on within video game. The downside of this solution is that his, vir uh, his virtual him is bound to the game and to the rules of the game. So you can actually meet James, but only if you play the game. When you shut the game down, then it disappears, only to reappear when you play the game again. And that makes me wonder, would it be, a, a, would it be possible to create a virtual person, a virtual me of myself, of you, that is not limited to the rules of some kind of game? And if so, what would that look like? And how do we have to do that? How can we achieve that? And in order to answer that question, and those questions, I would like to take you to a rather magical place, the castle of Hogwarts, that we all know from the relevant literature of Harry Potter, home of wizards and wizardry. Because what fascinates me about Hogwarts is that the castle itself has all these magical properties. So try to imagine. Harry Potter is walking throughout the castle with his trusty sidekicks, Ron and Hermione. And they are talking about all the things that teenage wizards are concerned with. Um, the grades of their latest courses, uh, battling people who should not be named, people who had magical nights with who, etc. And try to imagine these magical paintings. Because when Harry Potter and his friends are walking throughout the castle, then they, uh, they encounter these magical paintings. And these paintings are in, uh, able to understand and to see what is going on and what Harry is talking about. So you, in a certain sense, you have this, well, wizards, magical painting interactions. And that made me wonder, well, if my time would come someday, Will I be able to live on as my own magical painting? Well, then someone told me that Harry Potter was not real, that it was just fiction. Too bad, indeed. <laughs> so if we would translate this idea to the real world, then it might look a bit like this. Let this slide, this image, be your own household, or my household. Then what you see is this well, household member, this unsung hero, who <laughs> bears a remarkable resemblance with my own persona, but that's just a coincidence, of course, who is doing his everyday job. In this case, while well, he's about to cook some dinner, wash his hands, etc. Mounted near the kitchen sink, we have this computer monitor, the digital equivalent of a magical painting. And on it, we display a virtual person, 
I will refer to it as an avatar. This avatar is able to understand what's going on in this household. She can see me using uh, a webcam, and she can measure, for example, the things that I'm doing, like uh, the water consumption that I'm using when I'm washing my hands. She may give me certain feedback regarding my behavior. In this case, well, because we all would like to live environmental friendly, as we've heard during an earlier presentation, she might decide that I'm consuming too much uh, water. Therefore, she will give me feedback on that using, for example, subtle feedback like changing facial expressions. If I consume too much water, then she may, for example, start to look kind of sad at me or even angry, or when, as usually, I'm not listening again, then she might even start talking and shouting to me. Hmm. The interesting thing is that <laughs> this situation actually exists. And you can find it, and you can play with it and interact with it in the smart home in Eindhoven, near the Evoluon, so far for the commercials. And these systems can also be found in real households, like yours or mine, although they are pretty expensive. So far, these uh, avatar systems are only able to understand very easy, simple commands. Um, stop the music or play a movie, etc. So they listen and do exactly what you say, and in that sense, they are some kind of digital butlers. They do exactly what you say. Systems that do exactly what I say are kind of interesting, but what I would like to achieve is a system that is able to be seen as some kind of digital family member that is not only able to follow my commands, but also to understand what's going on with me, that knows how I'm feeling, what I'm thinking about, that can actually interact to me as a person or to you as per a people. And that might, might look a bit like this. <laughs> Imagine that the avatar is able to understand your verbal and nonverbal communication. That, is, that she is able, or in this case, that he is able, to understand what you feel. Well, it looks more or less like a he with a dress, but that's just a detail. <laughs> so why would this be useful, this, these digital family members? Well, imagine, for example, that you have a kid with autism. What do we know about people with autism? That they like and that they prefer and even require some stable factors in their life. In that case, a virtual person, like an avatar, can be some real assistance because he or she will always behave in the same way. She will dress in the same way and she will always respond in the same calm and nice way to the kid. So in that sense, when the kid is, for example, becoming agitated, then the avatar system may, with a calm, calm, voice, calm voice, ask the kid to calm down and provide feedback on the behavior of the kid. Or, being an intelligent system, the avatar may be able to work as some kind of, well, how shall I put it, um, an interactive understanding diary. Who of you had a diary when he or she was young? That's a, oh, to be honest, by the way, <laughs> that's an interesting number. And why did you have a diary? Why did you write in it? For me personally, it was because I would like to store my secrets somewhere in a safe place. I didn't wa want to keep them all in my head because that gave me all this chaos in my head, which was kind of creative but also kind of busy. So I would like to store my secrets in a safe place. The downside was that the diary itself could not respond to all these little secrets. So when I was again writing about well, all the girls that I liked that didn't see me back then, <laughs> that sounds kind of familiar, by the way. <laughs> That's just a detail. When I was writing down all these little secrets and details, then my diary used to uh, keep them, because diaries don't gossip. On the other hand, the diary itself did not respond in any way. If we would see 
the virtual avatar, the smart avatar, as an interactive diary, then he or she might listen to all my little secrets and everything that kept me busy during, well, puberty and etc. And the avatar might actually respond to it and give me advice. How could I, well, meet the girls and ask them for the telephone numbers, etc. Everything that kept me busy. So I see a lot of applications for all these smart avatars. The next question is, how can we create that? The interesting thing about computers and algorithms is that they are not able to understand context. They are not able to understand complex matter like our emotions. Luckily for us, this, uh, the field of artificial intelligence is working on things like this. And even though computers are not able to understand context and complex uh, things such as emotions, they do have one huge advantage. They are able to understand complex patterns and look for them in a very effective and fast way. For example, if I would like to develop an algorithm that is able to detect faces, very important when our avatar would like to look at our face and um, establish some kind of eye gaze contact with us, then what we need is this algorithm to detect what we call facial features, the characteristics of our face that make our face a face. And once these features are detected, then the algorithm may conclude that the thing is a face. So if we take a look at this well, anonymous lady, then we can feed this example to the algorithm for, uh, from which the algorithm will try to, uh, try to detect the facial features, such as the presence of a nose, the ears, maybe a beard, uh, and of course a mouth. And if a number of these features are present, then the algorithm is able to determine that the image is most likely a face. To achieve that, we need um, a number of artificial intelligence algorithms. For example, machine learning algorithms. And the general idea about machine learning algorithms is that they are able to detect certain patterns, but in order to do that, we need to train them. And we can do that by showing them a lot of what we call positive examples. So if I would like to train an algorithm to de detect faces, then I need a huge collection of, in this case, faces. And then you have your database with images from which uh, the faces are annotated, in this case, using a number of rectangles. And if I feed this huge collection of faces to our algorithm, and we let it, well, train and calculate for some time, then in the end, it will be able to see all the resemblances between all these faces and all these examples, after which it will be able to distinguish whether a new instance is a face or not. And this is basically something that already exists. Even better, your own very digital camera can do it. So you don't need any complex uh, supercomputer for it. No, your own digital camera can do it. So this is basically what science is at this very moment. The next step is that you don't want to only detect human faces, but that you also want to detect and understand social uh, signals, such as, for example, the nonverbal communication emitted by a person's body. For that, which is something that we are trying to achieve basically at this very moment, we need a similar approach. If I would like to detect certain gestures and certain um, social signals, then I again need a huge set of examples of these gestures, which you then can use to extract meaningful features by using your machine learning algorithm. And the interesting thing is, and that's of course a mere coincidence, that there is such a huge um, data set being developed within this very university as we speak. And that is, of course, a mere coincidence. That looks a bit like this. In this experiment, we had numerous people performing a number of uh, gestures 
which were all recorded and which will, will be fed to a machine learning algorithm. Oh, and well, if someone is wondering whether it is also a mere coincidence uh, that we had such uh, lovely little ladies in our database, no, it's not. Again, just a detail. So imagine that we have these avatars that are able to understand what is going on in your own household. They will live and exist as a digital family member for quite some time. They will see you for several, well, what, shall we, what shall we say, several months, years, probably even decades. You will grow up with them and they will see you day after day after day. Can you remember what I told you about this huge collection of examples? The interesting thing is that if an avatar sees you day after day after day, then the avatar also has a huge collection of examples of you. Everything that makes you, you, will be seen, will be measured by the avatar. If you are a person who is, well, grumpy in the morning, like me. If you like a huge portion of coffee before you start your day, well, like me. All these little things that make you, you, will be seen by the avatar. And the interesting thing is that if the avatar sees you for all this time and has all these examples of everything that makes you, you, then we are able to create a perfect copy of you, your own virtual you, that will behave in exactly the same way as you do, given this huge set of training examples, that will look exactly like you, that will respond in exactly the same way as you will do. So, To come back to Banksy, if your time comes, if my time comes, and I honestly hope that that will be quite some time from now, then your body will die, just like my body will die. But even though our bodies will die, our virtual us will live on. And when we are talking about living limitless, well, once my body gets rid, and gets rid of all the constraints that binds it to the rules of life, and my virtual me will live on, as long as, well, computers and energy, etc., exist, then I have a life without limits. And even though I will be gone, and I won't be able to, to be me anymore, then my virtual me will be able to do that and be as annoying and rude and all the things that I am will be done by my virtual me. And for me, that is living limitless. Thank you. <laughs>